Hey, it's Chris, Crisis Cycling Podcast, where I try to bring voices from Southwest Washington. These are progressives, thinkers, social justice warriors in some cases, environmentalists. I want to show that you're not alone. There are thousands of us here. I apologize for the last couple of podcasts. The sound hasn't been good. It was a technical issue that I've taken care of. Sounds not perfect, but it doesn't sound like you're in a tin can anymore. This podcast and YouTube is a panel discussion that we held after screening the film The Immigration Paradox at the Old Liberty Theater in downtown Ridgefield. We had two immigration attorneys, Yasinia Martinez and Eulalia Soto, both who work in Vancouver. We had the National Youth President of LULAC, Lindsay Lewis, and also Fawn Tran, who's a Ridgefield businesswoman, and she's also very active in the community. We pick up the conversation just as the panelists are reacting to the film, and the first voice you'll hear is that of Eulalia Soto. Be nice and kind to each other. I think that's, that's very important, and um, I think we need to just talk, talk and listen, and listen, and listen to each other and try to, try to understand and be empathetic and sympathetic to, other, to people's situation. Next to give her reaction to the film was Fawn Trang. There's a lot of deep issues um, in the film uh, that I wasn't even aware of. I think that one of the most important things is just to be open and to listen. Uh, but if anything, uh, really go with your heart. I don't know, I'm kind of speechless. Um, Lindsay Lewis. A lot of the things that I heard in the film tonight, um, there were things that I had known and it's just, um, it's good to see that there's two perspectives um, on this issue um, and I'm glad that both sides are getting um, kind of a, a say or they're getting uh, a voice and I think it just as a young person it empowers me a lot um, always to just create change always to keep an open mind especially in these times that there's a lot of hard things going on right now and in the future there's there's going to be a lot um, harder situations and it's just, it always teaches me to keep an open mind and just always strive for the betterness of the community. I did appreciate with the film that it kind of left it as like, um, you know, this is both sides. This is Yesenia Martinez. I think it was a little bit biased, but um, I did appreciate that it's showing perspective of both sides and that there's not really a solution. Um, and so it's a kind of open-ended question, like, what do we do from here? So I, I appreciated that from the film. I appreciated the history that, um, the in-depth history of immigration into the United States. Um, because I don't, even myself, <laughs> I don't know all that stuff. Um, and I, I'm sure there's a lot more, even practicing immigration law, I don't know all those things. Um, but for everyone else that doesn't do what Ulalia or myself do. I think it may have filled in some of those gaps that we, we're, we're, we as a society are having regarding immigration issues. What was the bias that I'm... Um, it, regarding immigration coming from the South. So I, I try to be really inclusive of like all immigrants when sure. I talk about immigration issues. Um, so I think it was a little bit more biased towards that, but there's um, like, I'm so sorry, I'm going to get your name wrong. Food. Food? Food? Food. Okay. Yeah. Food. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but like yourself, you, you come from a different part of the country that's not the southern border, uh, or different part of the world that's not the southern border of the United States. So there, I think there's a lot of untold stories there. Okay, so not a political bias necessarily. No, no not exactly oh, okay. a political bias, but just like a pers from a perspective of the southern border immigrants. Maybe, maybe, would you tell us a little of your story? Sure. Food? Yeah. Um, my family uh, lived in Vietnam. Uh, I was born there. And during the war, right after the war, uh, 1975, my father uh, was working with the South military. And he was killed right before uh, the war ended. Um, my mother was pregnant with my youngest sister. Um, so there's seven other siblings, single mom, uh, eight children, and uh, we, we 
were forced out of our homes when the communists uh, took over the country, they took everything, and uh, we moved to the country and lived, but we had no future, and so uh, we had to flee, flee the country. Um, we escaped by boat and uh, nearly died uh, through that escape, but miracles happened, and uh, we were saved, and we were sponsored to the U.S. See, I actually I see some parallels. Uh, the geographical like, location of the border aside, I see some parallels in U.S. policy in the past driving immigration to the U.S. Uh, U.S. failures in foreign policy, for instance, or U.S. Uh, machinations. I'm not thinking specifically about Guatemala and, uh, and Central America today. Uh, do you do you have any thoughts on that? Or did I just catch it completely off her? Did anybody? Yes. <laughs> I think with the immigration, it's, it's a lot of, like she was saying, there's so much more than just from the South. Um, people flee because of war reasons, lots of war. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you validated my opinion. <laughs> Uh, so, would you tell me what you do in, are you in court with people, or what is your, what happens day to day? Um, <laughs> it's a lot of writing, <laughs> um, to begin with. Um, this is Yesenia Martinez. I actually prefer to do deportation cases. Every case is different, but part of it is you're, you're trying to find evidence um, to substantiate a claim of for the most part, it's asylum cases um, that we're going to immigration court for. Do you have any success with asylum cases? Or can you tell us a story, a success yeah. story? <laughs> yeah. you... um, well, it's my my recent one. Um, it, and I'm, I'm sorry if I come off as like a little bit jolly because this isn't a very, this very sensitive situation. Um, but, I had a Guatemalan uh, case that it was granted for asylum, um, and it's an indigenous Guatemalan woman and her child um, just being persecuted by private actors. So there's a distinction within the law um, with asylum, whether it's the government or if it's a private actor that's doing the persecution. Um, and so when we talk about asylum, most of, most of the time people think of it as just political asylum, but there's actually um, five different categories, and, and then torture being a second category, uh, um, a, a sixth category, is that right? <laughs> um, the five bases for, for asylum, race, religion, national origin, political opinion, and membership in a particular social group. Yeah, um, thank you, because yeah. um, I always, forget them <laughs> without looking at the application itself. Um, so this particular client of mine fell into the group of membership in a particular social group, which most people seeking asylum into the country, if it's not based on political reasons, they're, they're probably gonna fall into various categories within, within the factors that you can seek asylum into the United States. Um, so this case was one of those, and they were getting persecuted by a private actor, not the actual government, but the government's generally not willing to help um, people within her position that also included the indigenous race of Guatemala. Um, asylum's really hard to win. So there's a lot of people that are coming to the United States seeking asylum without actually knowing that it's, it's a very difficult process. Um, most of the people coming to the United States that I've dealt with um, are victims of trauma. So they're, they're actually re-traumatizing. They're getting re-traumatizing when they're telling their stories and then having to tell their stories in a very, um, uh, it, well, probably for them it seems like a much more hostile environment, being on a stand in front of a judge um, with the attorney for the government also throwing questions in there that are trying to pick holes at their claims. 
Um, so it, it's a difficult process, and it's a difficult um, benefit to win in immigration court. So people who travel just to use the test case, uh, well, a single mother traveling up on foot with the baby in her arms to the border has to prove that <laughs> she is that to, to be. I, it just it strikes me. I don't, I don't I don't understand why we don't just welcome these people who are clearly self starters and bootstrappers. I don't, but that's you know, Lindsay. Uh, what do you do? What what is what is your or, or you know feel free to speak on any topic. But if you have a, I'm wondering what the president of youth LULAC does and yeah. what your day to day thing is. In, yeah, you kind of got to get yeah, um, get closer. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Right, right on there. Right on there. So, um, actually, uh, I oversee um, about 46 youth councils uh, within the United States. There's a couple different regions. It, I'm just really bad with directions, but there's a region um, on the Pacific Northwest so that includes like uh, Oregon, Washington, and um, Idaho, Alaska. and and Alaska, which is all over there. But and then there's like you know uh, the South southeast border and um, those areas and there's some on the east coast and then there's in Puerto Rico as well just because that's that's also part of the US and you know that's also Hispanics are there and you know LULAC represents Hispanics and um, and so then with that we just try to get youth involved into the community make youth leaders in their communities um, bring events like this but you know in, in like high schools and in the in the community but brought by youth um, and so I've only been in this position for a couple months, probably about two or three. So I'm still a little bit new, and we have a, we have kind of like a board, which each representative that re represents different parts of the United States and their youth councils. And we have around eight to nine people. So there's like parliamentary and a secretary, treasurer, etc. And then there's the vice presidents of the regions. And everybody oversees their own council. So there's actually my friend who's, at, who's the vice president of the Pacific Northwest. She overlooks the Washington councils and the Oregon and Idaho and Alaska. And we and those specific vice presidents work to make to create more youth councils. And you know I'm just kind of the person that empowers them and pushes them and tries to get everyone together to work for the better good, right? To make to create more youth councils and create leaders in the future that will be representing the Hispanic community and just the community in general. So it's not very, um, it's not like I like, I don't know, like go somewhere and like sit at a desk or something. <laughs> but um, we do have like, we do phone in um, video, video call meetings and we'll be like, okay, this is what we want. This is what we ask for. And a lot of the time, uh, the youth get pushed on a lot, kind of like, under the rug, swept under the rug, and um, and so we kind of like advocate a lot for the things that we need and that we that we that we need in order to become successful. So I just work a lot with the youth on that. And again, any high school that is like that has majority um, that has a Hispanic population or even just any any population of um, students that would like to create a LULAC chapter. Um, I can go and I can speak at that high school, which, you know, if it's like local, you know, Washington, Oregon, um, Idaho will do that trip, <laughs> you know, but it's just the main purpose is to create more youth council and more youth leaders. Organize. <laughs> Organize, yeah. Fantastic. Lalia, did you have a, a, a case that you can tell us about? I'm, what I'm curious about is how it, how it works when somebody comes to you. What, what happens? What, well, I personally, I personally practice before USCIS, which is the agency um, that process petitions, applications. Um, I practice before the immigration court. Um, I used to do bond hearings at the Tacoma Detention Center. I don't do that anymore. Ulalia Soto. Some of the cases in my 10 years of practice that really stood out was a Salvadorian woman that I, it was my pro, my pro bono case that I took through NERP, Northwest Immigrants Rights Project in Tacoma. And uh, I remember this lady, it was just like faucets. She just cried and cried and cried and cried. And uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a counselor. So I said, I need to hear your story. Just tell me, tell me. Horrible story, horrible story. Um, 
raped by her grandfather, had a child by 13, had four kids, three of them, one of them was murdered, two of the kids were, um, died of you know, illnesses that if you had money and could go to the doctor, they would. Um, her 13 year old was the boy that was shot. Uh, she left, ha had to leave her daughter, had to leave her daughter uh, with her mom. A uh, victim of domestic violence had three partners, just, you know, any kind of abuse, like all types of abuse she endured. And it's amazing that one person could endure so much. And um, to this day, uh, I helped her. We, we were able to uh, win the case. We won the case in Portland. Uh, Luckily, she found love. She has a new partner. She was able to bring her daughter from, from El Salvador here. And she is involved in her community, very involved in her church. And um, I think this is the first time in her life that is, she's truly happy. And that's just, that's amazing to see. And she's forever thankful. She's always, you know, very thankful. And I feel very fortunate that I was able to make that change and help her in that. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, and the reason she qualified for asylum was just, you know, her the her government was unable or unwilling to protect her from her abusers, from her grandfather, um, from the gangs that murdered her son. So there was a lot of issues, a lot of social groups that we used for her to be able to win her case. So that's one of those those cases that really st um, st it stands out. So it's just you know, in ten years you. You hear these horrible stories. I mean, and it's hard not, as a practitioner, not to take it home and and um, and feel for these people. And you see people coming to the border, to the border, and being turned away when you know all these people have, you know, along with their children, have endured so much. Um, and there's not a, they're not being welcomed, at least. And, and a lot of their stories are not even heard because they're not even allowed to even apply for asylum. So that's horrible. So when somebody gets asylum, are they they're, they're legal citizens of the United States and can work and pay taxes and all? How does that? So what are the, the, underlying, do, do the underlying question, and I'll, and I'll let you talk. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I do wander on and on. So I'll, I will, I'll ask the underlying question to me is what's so frightening about these people? We know, you know, beyond the, the headline grabbing MS-13 or whatever that they try to scare us with, why are we afraid of, of this Salvadoran woman? Um, I don't know. <laughs> There's really, uh, for the most part, they are, they are, they have no criminal history. For the most part, they are, they don't. They don't. And um, to answer your first question, when you're granted asylum, you have that status for a year. After a year, you can apply for your green card. Mm. And then after having your green card for five years, you can apply to become a U.S. citizen. So okay. it's all a process. So there's essentially an intermediary, intermediary period where they're evaluated, to use the worst term I can come up with, but Correct. there's this, there, it's not like you're asylum and then you're taking Fred's job at the job site. And there's, there's, a, there's a long period where somebody can prove themselves, I guess, to the people that need to be proved to. Kind of. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna just jump on here. Um, it's sorry, sorry. Um, it's not quite like I, I always tell people everything you know about immigration is wrong. Yesenia Martinez. Because you're just hearing the rhetoric or whatever on the media, and so I always tell people every everything you know about immigration is actually wrong. And I, I'm not an expert. I do this for work. <laughs> Things are always changing. So with regards to asylum, you do have to have somewhat, you have to have a clean record. Um, a lot of the people that are coming to the United States are asking for asylum. I, I think the misperception is that these people have no other opportunities in their home country and are poor people that are just coming to the country to work. Hmm. And that's not true. There's a lot of people that leave houses behind, families behind, they have to leave the next day, they have to escape like with only one or two people knowing that they have to go because their life is actually in danger. They leave so much behind and make the journey here, and if it's coming from the southern border, if it's coming from Asian countries, if it's coming from um, Africa, other well, continent of Africa. <laughs> um, People leave a lot behind, but they also have to have a good moral character. 
they also, like Ladia said, most of these people don't have any criminal records. Um, but when they ask for asylum at the border, they're going to get placed probably in a jail type of detention setting. And this is the first time that they've ever been placed in that type of situation. So they've already gone through all this trauma and now they're getting held captive as if they've committed a crime because they're seeking refuge in our country. So you, they do have to show some good moral character and clean records to, to an extent. There are things that happen. There are some people that do have some criminal history, but it's nothing that, um, that, that seems to be the minority, in my opinion, of the people that are coming to the country seeking refuge and asylum here. I wanted to ask Fawn uh, just about your memory. I know you were really young, but your memory of your mother's experience coming here without your father, but children, just kind of what that early experience was for her and for you. And then I think we should ask the audience questions if that's okay with everybody. But if you are. Yeah, I talk to my mother when, um, when I can and uh, to fill in the blanks because I was really young. Um, but yeah, uh, imagine being a single mom with eight young children. Um, she worked so many jobs just to support. Um, and so you had to be really strong. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Mm -hmm. Did anybody have any questions? Thanks. We do need you to speak into the mic. Go ahead. No, it, and it is less of a question and, and more of a statement to everyone. Um, the immigration issue is not a new issue, and I've kind of recently, um, and then I'm not going to get into the why, but kind of researched some of my own history. And even though everyone would look at me and think that I'm just a just a white guy, certainly not an immigrant. Um, my ancestors were refugee settlers to this country. Um, they were part of uh, a, a forced migration of German farmers in the early uh, 17th century. Uh, 1709, um, there was a, a big mass influx of Germans to England who were displaced by war and the English didn't know what to do with all these ignorant Germans that didn't speak English, and so they put them on boats as indentured servants and sent them to New York. Um, and the people in New York tried to make them work, and they didn't know what to do with them either. So um, it's not a new issue. That was in 1709. And it's been going on forever. And then you ask, why are people afraid of the other? And it's because they're the other. And that's what we do when we don't understand people, we fear them. And so I'm here to understand people and not fear them. Is there another question? While well, we're heading up there, we have uh, books for sale. You might have seen them. This is Jameson, if you stopped to talk to us. He's the one that wrote the book and he had, did a great presentation last month, uh, which is available in the podcast. You can listen to it. Um, about Transgender, transgender youth is really one of my favorite of our of our discussions here. But who have over up back there? I just in, on the news you're talking about the people are, right now they're leaving Central America because of gangs and people trying to kill the people. I just wonder what's going on. Why are they all killing people and all that? Do you like some of the history of the, that region? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, can, is everybody here that would speak to that? Um, the the majority of the people in the in, in in the group are from Honduras, and just Honduras has the highest homicide rate in the whole, in the world, one of the highest, if not the highest, and they also have the highest femicide rate, uh, femicide rate in in the world as well. So. Um, there's a lot of gangs, a lot of gangs. Uh, the situation is, is pretty horrendous, and people are fleeing, fleeing because they fear for their life, their kids' their kids' life. Um, it's just an awful situation, and the government is not able or willing to protect them from the gangs who are who are causing this chaos. These are resource-rich countries, 
Uh, is there a history that you, that, that you can speak to a little bit about why uh, these countries are so stratified? Um, I, I don't know the history of Honduras, so I, I, I don't know if you are f more familiar. I don't know. Um, I can't pinpoint exactly regarding Honduras, but um, I think one of the things we got to take in consideration regarding that is that there were, let's say MS-13 gang, let's use that one because that's a, a stark one that it's I can get up. right up on Sorry. That. Um, that gang started in the United States and then was brought into these uh, lower income communities. So people are generally, there's economic depression. Um, I know in El Salvador there was a 10 year civil war and that in Guatemala there was also a civil war that I believe lasted 36 years. So you have these countries that already have um, their own internal conflicts and then people struggling to survive economically. And so these gangs are then offering the youth um, an opportunity to get out of poverty, um, even though it's not the right opportunity. And so the gangs keep growing. They're trying to get more territory. The, the, the political structure in these governments is lacking. And they're very corrupt. They're usually working in conjunction with these gang um, organizations or, or cartels. Um, and I, I'm not sure if this is actually answering the question, but it's giving a, a little bit of uh, background regarding what's happened in Central America. So, so the gangs have then spread out to, even though it started, let's say El Salvador or Mexico with the cartels, um, it's spread out to other regions because it's part of the drug trade. Um, so you have all this stuff, and then you have the background of the civil, his, civil wars that have happened in these countries. Um, and I think, in my opinion, all of that together has created an environment of violence. I think if you're interested in the history, I'd start with, as a gateway, uh, looking at R Romero, who was just utterly canonized by the Catholic Church, did I get that correctly? Mm -hmm. He's now a saint. Now you can look at uh, Archbishop Romero, uh, and the other one I would suggest looking at, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, uh, was it Allende in Chile? Chile? Who's that? Allende? Did I get the name? Allende. Allende was deposed by U.S. forces in Chile in 1979. 9-1-1, 1979, oddly enough. Uh, but that, those are really good starts to, to how, uh, and of course Chile's not in Central America, but um, how outside forces have influenced uh, over 150 years now uh, our, our neighbors to the south and further south, uh, U.S. being one of those chief outside forces. Uh, is there another question? Oh, we have lots, great. Um, we're just have, oh, Dan, that's right. Dan's been waiting and waiting. Mm -hmm. My apologies. <laughs> Um, hearing a statistic of the government letting in 5,000 people um, for the purposes of immigration, and um, I have been a lifelong farmer, and getting people to work in the farms is very difficult. Um, you know, I, um, I still have property in, in the Central Valley of California, and it is tough going um, down there have to pay a whole lot more for labor, so we all get affected by that. So to say only 5,000 people, I mean, that's that's half the population of Ridgefield. I mean, that is not very many workers to cover the whole United States. And what would be so difficult about having some farmer housing for these workers and letting them go back home when they want to go back home. Um, it just seems ridiculous to let fruit actually rot in the fields rather than having a pit because it's too expensive or you know, you're going to be afraid that um, you're going to get arrested and taken away anyway. And the way we, um, you know, may, maybe not so much at the time when when Foon uh, immigrated to the United States, but we don't look down upon the people that came from Vietnam 
like we do other war-torn countries, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't do that. Hello. Hi. My name is Andreas, everybody. Uh, I was enjoying the documentary. I, um, I come from a Hispanic family. My father and mother are both Mexican. I was born in Texas. My father worked on farmlands all my life since I was in diapers. And uh, we didn't get much of an education. He would tell us to put our boots in our backpacks and go help him at the fields because we were so poor. My father, uh, until this, to, still to this day, works very hard. Hard working man, he's a Mexican. And I, I don't know, sometimes it's hard for me to claim a nationality, Mexican or American, because there's a big war going on, a big racism war going on, and I don't want to be a part of it. I, what I try to do most of the time is help people. I go to Mexico about two or three times a year, and like one of the ladies up there was saying, there's a lot of untold stories. I've seen a lot of those untold stories uh, firsthand, you know. Um, we've been shot at, you know, in our taxi by Mexican cartels. And I don't even know if they were pointing at us, they were just fighting with the police. Uh, there's a lot of people just trying to find refuge, asylum, like the ladies were saying, um, just trying to find a peaceful place to live and raise their families. And um, I think at the end of the day, we all need each other. And I think if we were to emphasize, or the people that were to emphasize that our war uh, love as much as they emphasize hate, I think we'd live in a much better place. You know, my dad, uh, after all his hard years of work, he, he created a, a landscaping business, and I think we're uh, growing strong in Richfield. Me and him, uh, we were in the business, and we, we help immigrants also. They work with us. They're not bad people. I think uh, one or two bad apples is giving a bad name to everybody, to all the Mexican community. When if we were to look at our own history, I mean, we, we can talk all day, you know? Uh, there's, there's bad everywhere. And I think what we're all doing here tonight, we are changing the world by coming here and informing ourselves about what's going on so we can educate the future of our children. And instead of, you know, teaching hate, because I think nobody is born to hate. It's something that's taught. We can teach love. I tell you, I, my wife Megan started this as a direct response to uh, the election of Trump and the hatred that I see coming out of Trump specifically and the, well, I can go on and on. Um, but we decided that our response was going to be to try to offer an opportunity to learn for those who want to learn. So I always am really thankful that everybody shows up and thank you for coming and thank you for your comment. Yes. It seems to me that um, one of the biggest objections I hear to having people come to our country, legally or illegally, even, is that there is this huge cost. Um, it's a drain on the taxpayer. And yet, on the other hand, I hear and see people who have multiple jobs and are working all the time. So I'm wondering, what is, um, what is our government's uh, position on helping people who are here. Uh, oh yeah, what does it cost? What, is, what does that act really cost? And then, I don't know, oh, I know Hector's I know, I know numbers, Sorry. numbers actually show that the immigrant community contributes, mm -hmm. contributes. Um, generally speaking, an undocumented person does not qualify for welfare as people tend to say they're coming here and getting welfare. They do not qualify for that. Um, they're contributing to the Social Security and they don't get Social Security. So they contribute more than what they cost. And that is shown time and time and time and time. Um, whether what statistics people choose to look, that's a whole different story. But um, the reality, the reality, the facts is, are that as the immigrant community contributes way more than they take. And that, and, and that is, yeah. I don't, have, I don't have the facts in front of me. Fascinating statistics too. Also immigrant communities tend to have a lot lower crime rates. Yes, and that's one of the other, that, you know, they hide, 
like the gentleman said, there's one apple, two bad apples, and then they generalize, and that is not the case. Um, I'm an immigrant myself. We come here and we work hard and try to get the American dream, and that's what we all want, that opportunity. And for the most part, that's what we work towards. I worked in a uh, group home in California for a bit, and there was a Vietnamese gang, and I think there were probably eight of them, but it was on the news. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, my name is Hector Nosa. Uh, a little background, I, and then I'll get to my question. So just very briefly. Uh, so I'm on one side of my family. I'm, I'm seventh generation Texan. Uh, well before there was a, uh, even a state, uh, and then on my mother's side, I'm. Uh, first generation, actually, because she, she uh, my grandfather brought her to Texas, South Texas, when she was three years old. So, uh, a combination of first and seventh generation Texan. Uh, and I've seen a lot of, so as a young child, five, four or five years old, um, my parents traveled and did uh, migrant work, farm work. Uh, green beans in Kentucky, or, uh, tomatoes in Ohio, and of course, picking cotton in Texas. But farm workers work their behinds off to make just enough money to buy groceries and to I was very lucky. I was sent to school. Um, I worked on the weekends, but I, I got to go to school. I got to go to college. Uh, they supported me to go to college. Uh, and not financially, mind you, but uh, emotionally, they, they backed, they wanted me to go to school. So, in that regards, I'm very lucky. And I've gotten to the point where I got to travel the world because I did go to school and uh, I still travel the world to see other cultures. My question, big as it may be, is that we get here from, from all over the world and people see the U.S. as this great place to be. All of them, everywhere I've been, even in Germany and Italy, Korea. I mean, everybody sees the U.S. as this shining example of a, a people growing, growing together. And the big question is, how can we come to this point, knowing everything we know about the world? How do we close our minds to, to folks just wanting to, to be in a safe place? provide for the families. So, how can we possibly get to this point that we're not able to figure out a way to welcome people to a better place? I just think it's a lot of political issues that have been raised, and I personally felt like I've grown up here, never have been discriminated or anything, until recently. Juan Tran. And what has changed? You know, I, I, I look at that, I ask myself that. What, what has changed? Why do I feel this way now? Uh, 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 may I say something? Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed. What has happened is that it's been uncapped. Mm -hmm. And I know this from personal experience. Did you have an Yeah. Um, it's a really big question, and I don't know how to address it, but the first thing that I could think of is that um, people are just scared of changing, you know? The majority is scared to become the minority, and just as our history shows that we've taken marginalized groups and minority groups and how we've um, exploited them and how we've, you know, made them however we, made, we wanted to make them, I, I think that that big fear of wanting to accept people is because we, or the people who, you know, have, have had this history and have had this mindset that, no, well, you know, I'm at the top, 
I'm, you know, the one that belongs here or whatever, that, that mindset is just scared to share that, you know, it's just scared to show the, share the culture, they're scared to just be welcoming because they never were. Um, my question is, uh, it's wonderful that everyone's here, um, but we're unfortunately a, a room full of adults. <laughs> And so many things happen at a younger level. Um, what can we do, or are we doing, um, in Ridgefield in particular? Because I, you know, living in other parts of the country or whatever, see this as a very, pardon the term, but white community. What can we do, or are we doing, um, with younger individuals, such as, uh, you know, grade schoolers, middle schoolers, etc., showing them, you know, material such as this, and have, engaging them in communication, so that things can change, as opposed to looking back and asking why. If we can educate at an early age, so that there's that these questions are happening at an early time. Boy, do I have an answer for you, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll get back to that. Did you have an answer to that? Did you want to speak to that? What's happening yeah. specifically, if not Ridgefield, in Vancouver, or this area? Yeah, so I just want to clarify. So you mean, what can adults do in order to... No. Or... What, what is being done with a larger group of younger people to educate them so that their ignorance isn't showing in the future to make... Poor decisions and right. In right. Um, I can say that as a student right now in high school, um, as a minority student, as a Latina in high school, I can say that I feel a lot of this conversation and a lot of this hate is done, is created because of the ignorance or the intolerance, right? right? Uh, I've always wanted or have always dreamed to have. Um, classes that don't just teach U.S. history, right? They teach, and if they do teach U.S. history, it's the real history, right? Mm -hmm. um, I fortunately go to a high school that um, we have just recently named ourselves the Center for International Studies, and that's the only high school that I've heard of in this region that teaches African American studies. And a lot of what I saw in this video is what I learned in that class. And I believe that if more students were, had the chance to have more culturally enriching history classes that taught us different cultures and taught us different perspectives and different stories, that you wouldn't have to look for that. You were given that in school. And it's not this crazy idea of, well, we're just going to brainwash everyone and everybody's just going to think one way, right? You would have everybody's story at the table, right? Especially with American history being so diverse, being so many different backgrounds, so many different cultural groups that immigrated here, so many groups that have started here, truly. It's just, um, it's just a sense of teaching knowledge. And I, I believe it starts with the schools. So I'm, 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 I'm going to hash it a bit, Rita. But Rita and I, and she's back here, she's, she's one of our real supporters. And uh, Damien Giles, who's running for, I forget, a terrible 17th position, uh, we sat in a meeting Monday with the superintendent of the schools in Ridgefield. And this is primarily Rita's initiative, and I love supporting her in this, in, so I, but I'm not very good at talking about it. But um, we sit pretty regularly with the superintendent. We discuss these issues specifically, and he is amenable amicable, whichever word is more appropriate, to, uh, to creating something like this. I guarantee you, if you went to Dr. Nathan McCann and said, hey, as a group, three or four people, and sat down, you know, we really want to get ethnic studies uh, taught as, as part of the curriculum, he will listen to you. We got him to agree, primarily again, Rita's uh, the force behind it, but we're starting a committee, uh, boy, I wish, do you feel like talking about it at all? As part of the teacher's contract this fall, there was a memorandum of understanding that the school district would have an equity team. 
a district-wide equity team. That, and that came from your work. I want you to take some credit. Well, yes, but also the teachers. The teachers care a lot about this. They do. And so it was part of the union's work as well. Um, so we're pleased about that. I would say, to answer your question, anybody here who would like to work with our Richfield community group, which Chris and Megan started, and our group is the Education Subcommittee, I'll, t I'll be more than happy to take your email address and keep you in communication. We would love to have I've multiple times at school district meetings. I'm not real popular there, but um, I think these are things they need to hear. And um, and if there were more of us, it would be very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. And to speak to the uh, young lady's point about student voices, this is one of the things that the high school teachers feel strongly about. Mm -hmm. I was at a meeting in Portland Saturday. The um, Northwest Teaching for Social Justice conference, extraordinarily impressive. And I learned that in Portland there are ethnic studies classes this was at Roosevelt High School. The teacher was there, her daughter who was in the class was there, and we learned that the reason it exists is because students press for it. If it's so, so much, sorry. Things are happening. And so, so much of it just is just showing up. There's just three or four of us that have shown up over a few times and we've had a few successes. We, they're, they're trying to push more uh, of, uh, African history African American History Month, uh, you know, it j just showing up or getting in contact with Rita or me and getting me your address and saying you want to be a part of the Richfield Community Group. Just finding us on Facebook and hitting like and then saying, hey, I want to be a part of the subcommittee on education. That's what we're trying to do. Yes. Yay, Kathy, one of my heroes. <laughs> How many of you live in Richfield? Oh, quite a few. Good. You're not giving yourself enough credit. We had a lovely multicultural fair. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are doing things in Richfield. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that was Megan's doing. She put together, this is my wife. She works full time as a physician. She put this together. She put together the multicultural festival, if you were here. Uh, second most attended event in Richfield this year. And she does other things too, and I don't really know how she does it, but that's one, that's one person, that's one person showing up, one person doing one, you know, just one person. Think what we could do together. Yes? Um, we're speaking a lot about the multicultural and the ethnic, but I really think the issue on why people are afraid, it's not a racial issue, and I come from a mixed race household. It's a class structure issue, and that's what people are afraid of. Yep. Afraid. It's class, and then as what the um, documentary showed, is we, if we address poverty, we're going to address the issue. And we haven't talked as the audience about poverty at all, but how we work on that. So no one wants to be the person on the bottom rung, and they're afraid. You know, if people were coming over and they were doctors or lawyers, this wouldn't be an issue. That in fact, when I said it, uh, I'll let you talk. When I said it, nothing has changed, I was wrong. The, the economy has gotten much harder. So. Actually, it is an issue. Um, you do have doctors and engineers and nurses coming, and they're not, they don't want them. It, this administration does, do not want them anymore. Eulalia Soto. So yeah, so when they're me closing immigration, legal or illegal, and so you are seeing that. Is, the H-1B visas that are professional visas have been, have been, you know, so, yeah. I mean, you have a question, and I'm sorry, I won't be able to pronounce your name, um, a young woman who um, has her uh, business in Richfield, and you said you've just now experienced it. Have you lived in the Northwest all your life? Pretty much, yeah. I grew up in uh, Beaverton, so pretty much primar primarily white. Um, <laughs> My significant other is African American, and he says when he's in the South, it's in your face when you're here, it's behind your back. And he joined the Clark, um, Clark, he works for Clark County, they had to have a special meeting for him when he joined in 1998 to announce that a black person was coming on board in 1998. So it's a, it's a, there's a very hidden race thing that goes on in the Northwest, as we know. Yeah, I, I, I feel like uh, because I speak English fluently, people don't judge me as much. Um, 
but recently I've experienced certain things that I'm like, hey, what was that? What was that? Um, so yeah, it made me pay attention a little more. Um, I just want to share like my experience. I moved up to the Vancouver, Washington area a, like a year and a half ago. I'm from the Bay Area, like in California. Race was never an issue. <laughs> like it just wasn't. I I grew up in a predominantly white town. It was eight to twelve percent minority, and of all minorities. But being in the Bay Area, I never experienced racism. And then um, then then I moved into the Central Valley in Modesto, um, California, which is agriculture, predominantly conservative um, political values. Um, and that's when I started seeing sexism and racism. And then I moved up here, and it's it's just, <laughs> I like I can when I walk into a room, I I'm like okay, all eyes are on me. Great, this is great. Like I went to a restaurant the other day, and I was like, oh geez, when's it gonna stop? Like, and I'm kind of joking about it, but like it it's really stark. And I'm just a recent transplant up here, um, or I had someone else. Recently, I've, I've talked to some of um, the other LULAC members about this. I've never been asked this question, but uh, this guy thought it was appropriate to ask me if I was born here. I was like, I'm not answering that. <laughs> like, so I, I've, never, I've just never been asked that question. Um, so I, I think we are living a very different time, but it, it's coming from very diverse um, uh, city uh, like San Francisco, Bay Area to hear it, there, it's it's a lot more in in your face than I've ever experienced. There. It's, it's definitely like the 1950s South or something. It's, it's really been a shock to me. Huh? I mean, were there any other questions? Oh, and I should say it's been a okay. shock to me because I'm, I'm in. Me. I'm like I get people oh. talking to me as if I'm a racist. <laughs> and, 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 because of my hair and my skin, I guess. It's really, I, I, I usually just don't even know how to react. Yeah. So here's the question. Um, as you know, our third congressional uh, district representative, Jimmy Ryan Butler, made a comment recently about the caravan of illegals coming up to the U.S and uh, she did not support allowing one single person from this caravan um, to enter the country, even if securing the border means deploying military personnel. Mm. So she was quite, I mean, this was on her Facebook post, and now she's blatantly come out and said what she really feels about immigrants. And she tries to use the excuse that her family is a Mexican background. It doesn't matter, right? So I'm just curious as you're, how do you feel about that? Um, because we are in a very sensitive time of our democracy, it is truly at risk. And what message do you have? Uh, not that you're advocating for one representative over another, but the mere reality that we are in a different uh, my thinking with our democracy. Uh, in my coffee shop, I say everyone is welcome in my coffee shop. That's how I see it, you know? It shouldn't be color or whatever. Everyone is welcome. So. I, I guess her comment is not very surprising since the whole time she's been um, supports whatever this administration says and this is what the administration says he's going to do and that's what she supports it. Um, I know for the last eight years we've been trying to meet with her and refuses to meet with us. Has she meet, if she, meet, she met with us she would know the concerns of the community, some of the background um, 
of the dreamers of the dreamers we've made various efforts so i guess i'm not shocked by her by her supporting supporting the military you know having the military at the border it's sad it's sad that that's her stand um, because there is a lot of valid asylum claims from the from the people coming and you see children so many children in that in that group and for her to take that stand is very inhumane and um just nasty in my in my opinion so one of the things that I think gets failed to get addressed is that asylum and refuge is an international law treaty. We are part of the UN. So there are things that we have to do as members of the UN, and that is allow people to seek refuge in our country. Um, so I, I and just I for the record, that's yeah. not happening a lot. It's, yeah. it's not happening a lot right now. It's, People are being denied even the possibility of being interviewed to see mm -hmm. if they pass that credible fear, that credible fear if they have a valid, a valid case for asylum. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So people are getting turned away at the border, and then when you when you're you're gonna create war against people that are coming from war ravaged countries like you're violating international treaties that our country is a part of. Um, aside from that aspect, there are she's she's not the only politician that's saying things like this or or justifying her words with the fact that her heritage is from an immigrant or minority or marginalized group. Um, whenever I try to, like personally, when I try to talk to people that have these values, um, I always try to bring it back to like, hey, let's let's find some common ground here. And what I try to get to with common ground is like, everyone's just trying to do something better for their family. Let's talk about family values. Um, I don't support what she. <laughs> she has said or other politicians have said regarding the matter because at the end of the day they're saying that these people are violating the laws of the United States but then there is an international law, international treaty and so how, how do you justify not letting people have the opportunity to come into the country seeking refuge here when, when we're also going to be violating an international law and treaty and an agreement that we've agreed to. I, it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> so I have, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to give Chris Tobobin is here. Yeah. He's, uh, you can tell me more about what you do. Do, do we have a mic? Do you mind? Do you mind? Can, can I call you out? The lady yeah. back there have a question. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, we'll get, it. we'll get to the question, but Chris Tobobin is running uh, first position 18th. Yes, sir. And I did a podcast with Chris on this immigration issue, and he was really informative. And I wish that we would uh, we could just hear. Maybe you could. Can you? Do you feel like responding at this time to her Butler's? Yeah. No. I uh, being part of the uh, the Marine Corps, uh, being run, running for office, I had a lot of unique, I guess, opinions and perspectives on this. But I spent the to, to uh, head that off. I spent the entire day today with Proud Boys of Future Prayer as a no hate just debate. I think that there's a, uh, we had eight or, eight or nine people from, that were willing to sit down across the, across the table. We had Bretman's out there and we just basically sat and listened and we talked. And despite the overwhelming disparity in opinions, uh, we had civil discussion the entire day. Nobody left angry, nobody yelled at anybody. There's one guy who's a little, uh, he has to say we, we prevented, I think they, uh, uh, an aggressive individual, but the bottom line is that with the efforts of you know, eight or nine people, we were able to talk to about 20 people that were otherwise protesting and, and you know, proud members of the Patriot Prayer and uh, uh, that, you know, what I, what I would like to bring up is that the, the reason we did this is because we wanted everybody to understand that nobody in our community has, has the right to threaten or intimidate another member of our community. What we found today was that they did not appreciate what they were, that what they were doing was great. They had no idea. And nobody, to this point in their lives, had told them that they were being threatened. Which, to me, means your, your information silo is so narrow that, that's, that, that, that didn't come up before. 
And so when I, would, when I would challenge everybody in this room and everybody that you talk to tonight, is that though the people in this room are of like mind and like vision, there are an overwhelming number of people. They're a minority, but they're overwhelming in their, in their uh, opinions. That we have to engage with. We have to find a way to connect with. Um, I, I'm, I am running for office, I've been an advocate for a long time, whether it's sexual assault, veterans, uh, unemployment, veterans suicide. Uh, I, I transitioned into this position uh, to not become an advocate and ask other people to work on my behalf and to do it on myself. Uh, work an advocate on your guys' behalf. Uh, I, I talked with, with Chris about this. I've had Marines that were themselves undocumented. I've had Marines that their spouses were undocumented. And I've, I've seen this issue uh, as a second hand. I've, I've been a bystander, you know, not, not anybody first hand. But I've seen it over my campaign. We have a first generation American uh, son of undocumented uh, uh, immigrants. And I have uh, one of my Marines from a long time ago who came out here to help me from Illinois. He is a, he is a, he is a Republican, there's no question about it. But they've been riding here now for about four and a half weeks, five weeks. And I believe I now have two Democrats riding around in my car. <laughs> and I say that not because Chris is any less ardent uh, uh, supporter of the, the net the flag or, or uh, conservative views, but he now understands that he cannot use the term illegal to describe Tony's parents. He understands now that the undocumented challenge that his parents face is something that is important to Chris, the, the, the other gentleman from Illinois. My point is that it took it took long conversations, it took hard conversations, and what you guys are doing here, I think, is a prep. This is to, this is like your pet rally right now. This is before you run out of the tunnel to meet the opponent on the other side. <laughs> That's what this is. So I, I'm not asking for your for your support necessarily as, as a candidate, but I would I would I would ask for your support for the, the women up front, Chris, your efforts. Uh, this is your opportunity to run out of the tunnel, engage with an opponent that is just like you, passionate, committed, focused, and help them understand that what they do makes other people feel threatened, intimidates other people, and start to talk them to the point that they might understand and appreciate your opinion as well. So Chris is, a, again, you can find the conversation that I had with him at CarsonCycling.com. You said somebody had asked Yes, she, she, oh. she said an answer. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. It's not a question. Oh, okay. It's not a question. It's actually uh, just a comment. And that goes off of what you said about the word illegal. It's so derogatory. I find it very um, dehumanizing. I think it makes us class people together as nothing. And so because we do that, it's easy to take decisions that actually dehumanize us. When we as Americans say that somebody is an illegal, then we don't want to hear their story. Their story means nothing to us because we decided they're wrong. And so it's, it's, such, it's so disheartening to, you know, to hear this story. And I know it's kind of from the southern border. My story is different. I'm, I'm an immigrant myself. But the truth is that um, when we when we um, when we put people together and decide that they're less than, then we can do whatever we like, and that's why we can separate children from their mothers and forget that these are people as well, just like us. Thank you, Bucky. Um, I think we should. Oh, one more question. First, I want to thank the women at the front of the room. I really appreciate you coming here, and, and you are so articulate in sharing with us your experiences, and I appreciate that very, very much. Um, I want to say we're, we're in the third, and we're part of Indivisible Vancouver that's working very hard to elect Carol and Mom, um, because part of flipping the house is, is finding people who are willing to talk to everybody, and Jamie Herrera Butler doesn't meet with anyone, so don't feel like she's just waiting. <laughs> Um, uh, something I wanted to share, we were talking earlier about Central America and some of the history about that. Um, there's an excellent documentary from 2012 called Harvest of Empire. It talks about how the U.S. Um, basically destabilized all the governments in Central America. It talks about them country by country and really gives a lot of great information. So if you're interested in that history, that's really good. 
It's Harvest of Empire. Harvest of Empire. All right, so just... Um, one, of, one of my burning questions about all this is I agree, we need to talk to people who feel differently than we do because we're all people. The challenge I have is how. Because I find myself really plugged in when I'm talking to somebody who's, you know, whether they're screaming or holding signs or just have beliefs that I find outlandish and, and, and inhuman. How do, how do you, you know, come from a center and, and engage in that conversation? And how do you find people who are willing to also engage? Because I, I think that's the point that we, we need to do. I just don't know how we get there sort of en masse. Chris has, he went out to the Proud Boy, I don't know if you're familiar with it, the Proud, Proud Boy Patriot, whatever those guys are, put a table down with a sign that said, no hate, just debate, and sat there, and sure enough, drew people over to talk to him. But Chris has a very unique way of speaking to people he disagrees with. I, I, so I got, I got thrown into this mix of talking to people that uh, have an immense amount of hate or just a uh, uh, despicable nature in Iraq of all places. So interrogations are long periods of time and my job was to, not I was not an interrogator, but we would capture people that were bad and have done heinous things. And I would sit in a room with these people for hours on end. And I speak Arabic, so I small talk. And what I found is that the person sitting on the other side of the room for me was just as human as I was, had his different set of experiences that shaped his, his, his perceptions on the world, and had demonized my existence. I had become less than human over a period of 18 to 25, 30 years of his existence. And what I saw today was a very similar existence. I saw people that had, over a short period of time, because the internet is a, is a powerful tool, they had come to appreciate uh, I use the term not to offend anybody, the libtards, uh, uh, as a subhuman category of, of existence. And so what I, what I tr tried to take into account when I was listening to folks today and what I did you know, many years ago was that they came to this perception with the same interworkings of a brain, of brain matter that I have now operated. And so I gave them the benefit of the doubt that they are not inherently flawed, that they are not inherently broken, but they have had a line of experiences that are drastically different than my own. And that if they were to recognize some of the experiences that I have seen, some of the people that I have seen, that first-hand testimony is a powerful thing. And I, one young man today, 18 years old, was by every definition being radicalized in a violent manner. And he was arguing why it is justified in order to hurt and potentially kill those who would destroy the country from the liberal side. We talked to him for two hours and 15 minutes today. Cool. Mm -hmm. Over that time, we went through innumerable number of topics to address his concerns. It took an immense amount of patience, but it I genuinely, I can't, I can't articulate that enough. Like we, my campaign manager spent two, two hours and 15 minutes talking to this young man. And it was the best use of his time for my, not for my campaign, but for his manager. Mm -hmm. But that's what it takes, it takes a amount of patience. And uh, I don't know how you do it, but it, uh, sitting there without, without talking is a good start. <coughs> Simeon, you, you, you mentioned that everybody thinks that they're doing the right thing or for their family, I forget exactly where you, would you re revisit that kind of, that? because that's underlying what he's saying, everybody yeah. thinks they're doing the right thing. How do we address people who are doing terrible things that think it's the right thing? <laughs> <laughs> that's a big one, huh? Uh, yeah, um, I try to, if I, if I ever engage in conversation that is to, you know, let, let me see if I can plant a seed. It doesn't have to be you're gonna change your mind today, you're gonna drastically change it in the future. It's just maybe you're gonna start considering um, the other side and just be like, you know, yeah, maybe I should be a little bit more empathetic towards these people. Um, 
and I'm, I think I might get be losing track of it, but, but family values is yeah. something I start with. Um, yeah. so I think, <laughs> I think no, going back to the beginning of the film though, like, you know, she was like, they were asking her, which side are you on? Which side are you on? And I feel like everybody feels like they have to take a side, but you don't. The thing is, like, I encourage people to not take a side and really learn, educate yourself, and then decide for yourself. But I feel like a lot of people are either being uh, misguided by their peers or their parents or and I'm going into like with what Barb was asking earlier like how do we deal with children uh, and and I feel like the children are listening to what their parents are telling them and then going into school and you know yeah. um, so I've heard of stories like that and I've just I wish that we would be more open do not take a side because of political reasons and maybe just you know, learn for ourselves. Uh, I just want to say it's hard not to take a side when the other side is take dehumanizing it. you and insulting you. And, you know, so it's hard not to take a side and not take it personal. And when you try to address that person, it just blows you off because you're so insignificant that they're not even willing to give you the time of the day. So I guess that's just my personal view that that is very hard. And I guess. I'm not that big a person, but no, that's just, that's, no, that's just me. I don't think that, because uh, I feel the same way. Like, I have, I'm not, I, I, I really want to go do Chris's hate not debate, but I... No, the opposite. Well, he has the white privilege, but when so, you're a Hispanic so, Latina and they're attacking your own, your existence, that's a whole different story. Yeah, we had uh, two LGBTQ, one black, one Latino, uh, out of the nine people, so we had four minority groups represented with us that were participating in the discussion and at no time were they rendered any less respect today than, than I was. Good. Good. But, uh, let me just let me just interject. Yeah. So our, our <laughs> members of our community have come to LULAC and have ex have expressed their experiences they have in the community, just eating dinner with their families and being harassed by waitresses, and see, and they don't have a voice because either they're too afraid to call the police because of their undocumented status. So we see this, and you know that's that's great that you had that experience today, but I think the reality for the community is not that that they have a voice and they have the opportunity to carry on a dialogue. That that is not. I, I sorry. The, my point is not to say that it doesn't exist. My point is that today, in the forum of, with the title behind us, a big sign, four signs, and no age of debate, we had a forum where everybody involved understood that you will not be tolerated if, you're, if your language degrades the other person. And I cut people off before they, they got down this road. But what it took is an, it, it took a, almost a moderator of sorts yeah. to moderate the discussion. So Danny Giles was one of the gentlemen there. Uh, you guys probably know him better than I do. Uh, good man, He was heated a couple times, and the, 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 we were able to maintain a, a civil dialogue where nobody was disrespected because everybody understood that it was unacceptable. I think the, the situation that you're talking about where in, in community is passing, uh, the Latino or otherwise are discriminated or disrespected is because they feel it's appropriate in those environments. Yes. And that's where, Chris and I talked about this before, it falls on those with the majority to step up and crush those individuals yes. on the spot mm -hmm. and so, destroy that level of problem. So, What's underlying this, uh, the, the, you know, even a bigger issue is just misogyny and the assumption that your voice is less important, right? So it is easier for Damien to sit at a table than it is, uh, maybe not used to, you're a brawler or something. <laughs> uh, but, there, but there's this kind of natural, uh, I don't know, you know, there's this natural thing where she's an attorney. Yeah, she's, oh, yeah. she's, she's learned how to. She's learned. She's she's yeah. Uh, actually, Chris was the first one that really explained the white privilege. I think you just said it to me to where I really understood where it was coming from. Uh, in that, I do feel that I can speak to anybody 
about anything at any time. And it, it didn't occur to me as a privilege, it's just how I roll, right? Uh, but, but I didn't realize that people... I think that maybe that's where you guys are kind of dividing in a, in a little bit. Although I think Chris kind of laid out yes. the actual mechanics of it. Yeah, and he's, well, he's also, yeah, he's, yeah, he's... I, I, I have my purpose, so... Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a Marine Major, so, you know, he's got, he's got that. Uh, last comments, boy, we went way over time and ran people out. Usually we're, we're done before everybody gets up and leaves, but uh, I kept you and kept you and kept you. It was really interesting, but just can we go down and just have like a last comments, last thoughts, uh, what we can do, real specific, or, or any, just a two, three minutes? Um, okay, I, uh, what to do. <laughs> yeah, Go out do. there and find community groups that resonate with the values that we want to move forward in our country and not hold ourselves back and just start doing some volunteer work. Um, that gets the conversation going. That gets you out in the, in, in the public eye to share your thoughts and share your values and, in my opinion, the correct values. <laughs> um, and. Uh, stop the racism and hate and and um, misogyny because I think this is also related to women's rights issues and uh, all the marginalized community issues um, but try to be proactive in your community try to get the word out try to go to as many events as you possibly can and just it feels good to serve your community so just even if it even if it's like an hour <laughs> just do something to to show Solidarity. Sorry. Um, just any anything. Just do something. Just show up. Yeah. Just show up. Just show up. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first thing I would say is always go by the golden rule. Treat others how you want to be treated. Have an open mind. What we all have done today is having an open mind, right? There. We're here because we want to learn. We're here because we want to see others' perspectives. You know. And that, that's the first step. The second thing that I would say, and I'm a little biased with this, is empower the youth, right? If I didn't have mentors that are in this room right now that have inspired me, and if I didn't have mentors in my school that even just were just questioning me or even would just telling me to do something that I wouldn't have done by myself, I probably wouldn't be in this room having this discussion with you all, being in front right here, you know, spending a school night right here. And I think it's just, it all, I, I believe it all starts with the youth, right? Because they're the ones that continue. And it's just, we're, we're the ones that like, we're feels, I, I mean, you know, we're like, wow, we can change the world. And, and it takes somebody behind us to push us, mm -hmm. so. Um, I like to say, I say this to myself, um, I, I pray for the courage um, to be the voice for people who can't. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, I don't like talking about myself. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> my story is very private to me, um, but the courage to speak in groups. Um, because there are probably a lot of people who can't talk um, or have that voice just to say, um, to tell their story. And if you can be that person, mm, um, I think that's what we need. More and more people to be able to do that. To be humans. Yeah. First of all, I just want to thank you for being here. Um, that, I think that's great. Um, uh, we do have an event if you want to be part, like Jasenia suggested, we, we want to take part. We do have an event this Friday, and it's to raise funds for our youth, and it's going to be at um, Warehouse 23 at 7.30 to 9 in the morning, and it's, it's breakfast, and it's $45 a ticket. To raise funds for our youth, and we're, we have the honor to have uh, Judge Supre Supreme Court Justice Steve Gonzalez is going to address our youth there. So um, if you have some time, it'd be, you're well, more than welcome to be there. Washington State Supreme Court. That's correct. Yes, that's correct. Um, so yes, uh, I just, 
Yeah, just be nice. Oh my god, it doesn't it doesn't take much. Just, just be just nice. Mind That's, your own business and be nice. No, I'm not my own business oh, because if something's I'm, happening, you I'm, need to stand up for that person yeah, yeah. that doesn't have the voice. If you but see something, say something. Exactly. Something, exactly. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, you know, you can revisit this at crisiscycling.com. Thank you for the old Well, thank you for participating in our panel. Uh, if you watched and commented, I really appreciate it. Please like and subscribe to these videos. I can't do it without you. The most important thing you can do is share this. Share the video or the podcast. You can also contact me through crisiscycling.com. Let me know who you think I should be interviewing. And I appreciate your time. Also, check out my Patreon account. I plan on doing as many of these videos as I can and the only limiting factor I have is that I need your help. Become a patron please and we can do this together. And you should find the link in the comments below once I set that account up. Christmas Eve.